<laughs> hey, it's the end of an era, the magazine era. The 20th century was the key period in our history when we communicated our outdoor message through magazines. And as those are going away, do we have a threat of losing our hunting heritage? We're going to find out on this episode of Ron Spomer Outdoors. Hi everyone, this is Ron Spomer with my good friend Tom Gresham. You might recognize his voice, if not his face, because he's <laughs> the voice happen. of radio. That does happen, yeah, doing the Gun Talk Radio. Yeah, Gun Talk Radio. Tom's been in it a long time. You know, we're right here in Lewiston, Idaho, you know, with the Jack O'Connor Center. It's an, it's an amazing place. It's not huge, but it's chock-a-block full. And if you like hunting and guns, you're going to love this place. Yeah. So for those of you who don't know Jack O'Connor, he was the outdoor hunting writer of Outdoor Life magazine in the middle of the 20th century from roughly 1935 until the 1976 or so. Right. And he was the man, the authority, if you wanted to know anything about hunting and guns around the world. And he was the 270 guy. Right. I mean, he really did popularize and make the 270 work. Of course, he was known as a sheep hunter, but he hunted everything. Yeah. We, and you, we walk around here, got all these trophies and the, the heads you Talk see back here. Talk sheep hunter. Look at that. Phenomenal. <laughs> I mean, we're talking some serious sheep right Look here. That you know, but yeah, he was the 270 guy. But at the same time, he liked the 257 Roberts. He would use a 30 out six a lot, use yeah. a 338. Yeah. Basically, whatever the tool was needed, mm -hmm. he was practical about that. Sure he was. You know, and, and and I think that's one of the messages we need to push these days. Everybody is getting so compartmentalized with a particular little caliber and bullet and velocity. And I think we just all need to understand that they can all work as long as you work. This well, is the shooter. But we know that a, a bullet that measures .264 is so much better than one that measures .277. Well, I didn't want to get into that, but it's true. <laughs> the 6.5 is the only way to fly. Right, this week. That's probably the only one a Jack never worked with. Yeah, no, we are, I bet he used a 6.5 by 55, 55 somewhere along yeah. the way, which still works just great. Yeah. But his wife, Eleanor, of course, hunted with him a lot. Right. She went to Africa and all. She hunted in Mexico with him, and she used mostly a 757 Mauser. Right. And we have that rifle uh, on display here. We're going to take a look at it. That's one of the things that's amazing when you come here. You get to see the guns as well as the heads. But, you know, I want to circle back. You talked about the the magazines. Mm -hmm. And today it may be difficult for people to understand the impact of the magazines. You waited each month for that magazine to appear and you waited to see what Jack O'Connor was going to do or what Elmer Keith was going to say. And then you talk about time lag. One would write a piece and then two or three months later, the other would answer that piece. And for some reason, people were just <laughs> wanted to you know, now it's like instant you yes. know, click, click, click. But it was a three or four month response time back then. But it was Outdoor Life Field and Stream Sports of Field and the American Hunter, or American Rifleman, rather. American Rifleman, right. Yeah. And then along came Guns and Ammo, which kind of was later on. Yeah. But the big three, that was that was the deal. And yeah. that's, where you, that's where you went for your information. We had all pre-internet. Yeah. Right. And, Tom, that is, of course, where we went for our authorities. And they were vetted. You didn't just hear from everyone. With the internet, you don't know who to trust because anybody can pop up on the internet and say he's an expert. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, my dad was the shooting editor of Sports and Field magazine for like 27 years. Mm -hmm. You didn't get to that position without having been a writer and yeah. been accepted for many, many years. Yeah. So you're, and really the truth of it was, there were only five to seven gun slash hunting writers right. of any note back then. Yeah. Yep. So that's the difference, folks, and I think that's what we're losing. But this Jack O'Connor Hunting Heritage Center in Lewiston, Idaho, where he lived for many, many years, he started off in Arizona, right. and then he came up here, and that's where he spent the bulk of his career. But they have put together this center that captures that era. Of course, it's all about Jack and what he produced, right. but still, you've got the old magazines here, you have his books, you have his trophy and his stories on plaques and such, so that you get to understand what it was like to be the gun writer for Outdoor Life magazine in the 1950s and 60s and 70s. When you would take a hunting trip that would last two or three weeks Sometimes or months, months yeah. depending on where you were going, D different era. Yeah, some of these sheep hunts, he'd get up into British Columbia and ride and ride and hunt for three weeks and never take a shot. Right. right. And he, he was selective. But the wonderful thing about those days, you could afford to be selective. And you were probably the first guy in that mountain range for the last 40 years or so, maybe yeah. the first ever. 
I had a thought this morning. I was thinking about Jack of the 270 mm -hmm. and how prescient that was. And you look at what's going on right now, 277 Sig Fury, yep. the 6.8 Western. Western. You know, it's like people are rediscovering that 277 caliber and going, yeah. well, that thing really works. And you got like four generations who say, yeah, we knew that. Yeah, we knew that all along. <laughs> it's just, just a twist rate that's a little different. Exactly right. Now you can use the magic bullets. Yeah. Magic bullets, they're long and skinny. That's right. Yeah, And there's a lot to be said for high BC bullets, of course, but that's what's driving all this new cartridge sure development. Is. But the crazy thing was when Jack started, the 270 had just come out. He bought one the first year it was out, 1925. Right. He picked up a Model 54 Winchester bolt action and fell in love with that 270. But it didn't take off right away. Oh, no. No, it took a while. But I mean, but look, if you're into really nice rifles, if you come here, you're going to see some of the most spectacular, beautiful, custom rifles. It's like you just want to fondle them. The wood is so gorgeous. Well, speak for yourself. <laughs> I, I love picking up a, a rifle with a wood stock. It just feels better to me. Yeah. yeah feels yeah. real. And, you know, I can't imagine. These days, it's all about synthetics and, and stainless and Cerakotes. And, and they it, work. They, yeah, obviously they work. But somehow Jack managed to spend a month up in the Cassiars or up in Alaska and, and his rifle seemed to survive with yes. a walnut stock and a blue barrel. Yes, they did. You know, and, and so along those lines, if you get a chance to pick up a really nice wood stock rifle, don't be afraid of it. If you grow, have grown up in the synthetic age, don't be afraid of wood stocks. Yes. A lot of them shoot really well. All of the early bench rest guns were yes. wood stocks. Sure. Yeah, I think we made way too much of the warping walnut idea. Right. Some people think it's like a, taking spaghetti and throw it in boiling water. My gosh, it'll never work again. But yeah, we'll show some images of these beautiful rifles here. And uh, they're spectacular and they're how old now? Some of these things are probably 60, 70 years old. Yeah, easy. Yeah. yeah, the other thing I was just thinking, if you come to the center here to see this, you're also now in Lewiston, Idaho. You're also right here at Hell's Canyon. You know, take advantage of. You could bring the family. You could do the whole vacation oh, thing. Boat you can do jet river. boat trips yep, up yep, here. Yep. It's a spectacular piece of a country here, and we're right hard on the Oregon Idaho border. It's a just fabulous place. So this could be kind of the center point of a trip. Sure, oh, there's and, so much more to do. And then, of course, there's the Lewis and Clark expedition. This is called Lewiston because of Meriwether Lewis. Right. And right across the Snake River is. Clarkston <laughs> with William S. Clark, and that was the voyage of discovery. Yes. So, and, and you drive Highway 12, which pretty much parallels their route into this country. Of course, right. they were up on the high ridge, but you get to see all that stunning, historically beautiful country and the beautiful rivers that were here, and Jack lived right in it. I know. I mean, they say that he actually had a key to the CCI Spear factory here. He could go in at night and use their lab. Oh my to goodness, do his testing. Which when we drive here, we're driving right by the yeah. CCI Spear factory, which right. is you keep wanting to pull over and see if they have any samples. I, I had that don't. urge this morning. <laughs> they were closed, they wouldn't even let me in. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's just tour around a little bit, Tom, and uh, look at some of the displays, talk about them a little bit and show folks what they can expect to see here. It's spectacular. All right. Boy, he has some nice Africa stuff, doesn't he? Yes. That sable is crazy. It's impressive. I mean, talk about from the glory days. Yeah, really. Man. Wow. I'm like, there's those old magazines. Really cool. So Jack hunted Africa quite a bit. He started, I think, in 51, if I remember right. right. And this would have been the era in which travel improved, the ease of getting there. Yeah, because before that, you had to go on a ship. Yeah. You know, and then, of course, now suddenly we can fly. Mm -hmm. And it, it just made Africa and the world accessible. Right. And this was post-World War II. Right. People were starting to, you know, jobs, money, free time. Right. This was the new deal. It was, it, the, the timing was perfect for him. You know, 30 years earlier, probably not so much. No, no. But everything worked out post-war. People had money. Yep. They had time. And they had the interest. Yeah. And they were reading all these magazines. Well, this is why they had the interest. People like Jack going over there and doing it, and reporting back. Right. And it, I remember this is how I got started in sort of adventure hunting. Of course, I was pheasant hunting as a kid right. and all the things. But I saw an Outdoor Life magazine on my uncle's table with a lion on the cover. Right. Wow, this just looked impressive. You know, I started looking at it. And that was the first time my consciousness that I can remember thinking of anything about a magazine. And that just hooked me. I started reading all the magazines. And then, of course, I was reading your dad in Sports of Field and everyone else who inspired me. And that's what I 
we're going to miss, I think, the generation that doesn't have that. And you that. can imagine what it was like for me growing up as the son of one of these writers. Yeah, I was going to ask you, it what was, was that like? It was pretty great. I mean, <laughs> you know, we had we got all the new guns. Yeah. You know, Dad was a gun writer, hunting writer, wrote for Sports Field, but also wrote for a lot of other magazines. Mm -hmm. And, of course, people know him from the, the Miller beer commercials. Light beer for Miller tastes just great. You know, tastes great, less filling. Less filling. He was one tastes of those great. guys. Are you and fast I, fisher? You're not going to tell him, but I'm going to tell him Ron also received the Grits Gresham Communicator of the Year Award uh, a few years ago. And boy, was I surprised and tickled to get that. So, I mean, well, and well earned. I mean, you you have carved out a really great niche for yourself, and you do a wonderful job of explaining things that are sometimes hard to understand. And when you talk about it, it's just easy for people to get it. So you do a great job. Oh, I appreciate that. I always figure if I can understand it, then it's understandable. You know? <laughs> I hear you. And, and that's kind of part of the, the job, especially now that people are really into the, the technical. I call it the gun geek stuff. Yeah, you, know? you do a great we're, job. We're talking that. spin rates and yeah. you know, twist rates and spin drift and Coriolis effect. And it was like, ah, I don't know what all that is now. You know, uh, Jack didn't deal too much in Coriolis. But no. whenever he did bring something up, he did his research because he nailed it. Well, he was a college professor. Yeah. You know, he, he was an English teacher, right? Right. You know, so yes, he could write, but he could also shoot. He could also hunt. And he was serious about this. And occasionally he would make disparaging remarks about other writers because he didn't think that they really lived up to what they were supposed to be doing. Yeah. Well, you know, the, that era had well, probably the same as we have now. You had your doers and you had your thinkers. And they didn't always mesh. That's a good point. I mean, like his, I don't know if he's his nemesis, but Elmer Keith, of course, the, the story was that Elmer Keith was butting heads with Jack all the time because Elmer was a real deal cowboy. He was yes. a packer. He was a guy. He went out west in a covered wagon. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, he was the, the deal. Yeah. He, he was old throwback guy. And he was all about a big bullet, a big gun, big stuff. And Jack was a little more cerebral thinking right. about right. things. And so the two of them, their personalities probably didn't mesh. But, but each of them helped the other one by playing off against yes. big bullets, small bullets yep. going fast, playing you know, the back and forth. And I think it helped both their careers that I they did so that. I think so too, yeah. You know. And who knows, they were probably plotting behind the scenes. Huh? <laughs> could, could be. But, you know, you look at what we have here, and there was a time when Africa, more of it was open. You know, more countries yes. were available. Right. Places Kenya, we can't go now. Right. Kenya. Yeah. Yep. Uh, life lesson. I remember dad saying, you know, he got invited to go hunt in Kenya. And he says, can't do that this year, but maybe next year or the next year. And then they closed it down. It's one of those deals that I asked him once. I said, well, you know, what are the things that you regret doing? Yeah. He said, you know, I really don't regret doing anything, but there are a lot of things I regret not, not doing. doing. Yeah. So there it is. You know, Kenya closed down on him. So. But, you know, all, all that to say, but now Africa is available again in a lot of places. And it's affordable. it's affordable. That's where I was going to go. I mean, you go on a sheep hunt, you could go on like six Africa hunts yeah. for what some of these sheep hunts are going yeah. for. Yeah. I, I harp on that a lot. I mean, I hate to say it, guys, but one moose hunt in Alaska is going to cost you probably more than 10 animals from Southern Africa. Isn't that amazing? Is it crazy? It really is. Yeah, you would think, well, Africa, I can't afford that. Yes, you can. Yeah, just go check it out. Actually, you can. And the other part of it is, we can get into the gun thing, is, you know, borrowing off of the 270 with Jack, take the guns that you know how to shoot. Absolutely. Don't go buy you some big, kicking, loud, and boomer thing <laughs> that you can't really shoot well. A 270 will kill all the planes game. Yep. Your alt 6 will, your 7 mag will. Yep. If you're up to the 300 mag, fine. And then if you need something bigger. Yeah, Cape Buffalo. Yeah, okay, you can get that. Or a lot of times you can just rent it. For yeah. PH. yeah, and that makes it so much easier for travel. Oh, it's getting yeah. difficult to travel with firearms these days. You know, everyone has their limits. You can't take more than this many rifles. You've got to make sure that they're locked up with a trigger lock or something like that. And this airline allows you to take three guns. The next one only allows you to take two. Yeah. The country wants you to spend some money, so they're going to fine you or get a tax off your rifle. You import a rifle, that'll be $100 a day or something. Well, what I do is they won't let me take enough ammo. I just put it all in my pockets while I'm getting on the airplane. <laughs> I had a friend no. do that. They found it. <laughs> no. Oh, my God. Don't do that. that <laughs> no, that's don't do truly that. one of those don't do that things. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, even with cameras, when we first started going over there in the 90s, you had to take all your 36 exposure rolls oh, of film along in your couldn't, pockets. Couldn't get them x-rayed. And yeah. you don't want to get them x-rayed, so you'd have to have them individually look at each yeah. one of them. Was but no, Africa is, uh, somebody described it as cocaine for hunters. <laughs> Once you go, all you think about is how can I get back? Oh, gosh, it's, that is true. It is true, it's isn't true. it? It's true, it is. It's yeah. an amazing thing. And if you're into that, you just talk about getting your fix. This is the place. I mean, yeah, look at get, this. You want to get fired up and look at some stuff and just go, I'd like to do that. I can understand it. It's phenomenal. And I get to do it with Ron Spomer. That's pretty cool, too. Yeah, we're going to go over to Africa one of these years and show them how it's done. Noon? I think we should wait until the evening flight and okay. we can get dinner. Good All right, All sounds right. good to me. Let's go to up into Canada over here. I see some heads that look a little cooler than Africa. Hi, I'm Ron Spomer. and Oh, I'm sorry. Not really, oh. but... You're lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, there's a lot of this British Columbia stuff up here, stone sheep. That man went on a lot of sheep hunts, you know. <laughs> he really did. You know, I, I mean, obviously got the Grand Slam. He may have more than one slam. I don't know. Yeah. But, hey, if you want to find out, come to the Jack O'Connor Hunting Heritage and Education Center in Hell's Gate State Park, Lewiston, Idaho, and see for yourself because this is really an impressive display. And it tells the story of the... Hunter's ability to communicate and build a support community of like-minded folks. Yeah, and also you get a little taste of the role of hunting and conservation through the years. Because, you know, when he started out, there weren't a lot of whitetails in the country. There weren't a lot of elk in the country. There certainly weren't very many turkeys, for instance. That's why he always went up to the wilderness. Yeah, so now we have big game everywhere. I mean... They got elk in Kentucky for heaven's sake. Elk in Pennsylvania. It's crazy, yes. you know. It, it, so it's kind of hard to understand what it was like back then, and that's why you had to go to these places, make sure. these exotic trips. Now we make an exotic trip to Pennsylvania. Yeah, he went to <laughs> India, Iran, a lot of places where you had to go to find different game because right. you say that just wasn't here. But and and the, I think the important part is not just the 270 and let's go hunting. But it is the conservation. Your dad and all the rest of the writers in that era would regularly comment on and mention the conservation programs that made it all possible. They were at the cutting edge. There were magazines back in the 1860s and 70s and 80s, and they started this conservation trend. Right. Was it Forest and Stream Forest or something? Forest and Stream. And then, of course, from that movement, we got the Pittman-Robertson Act. Yes. Where... You know, all of our guns and all of our ammo, there's an excise tax on all of that. Yep. And that money is spent for conservation. Yeah. So every time you buy ammunition, every time you buy a new firearm, 11% tax that you have paid goes to conservation, habitat improvement, species reintroductions. And all that is because of the old writers of magazines, the early conservationists, even earlier than Teddy Roosevelt, but he was one of the big ones around right. the turn of right. the century. So hunters actually pay for conservation. Yeah. Others pay lip service. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, or disservice. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> so, yeah, it's all part of the program, and I think we are the beneficiaries. You know, you and I have had some grand hunting over the oh, yeah. years, and it was all made possible by your dad, my dad, O'Connor, the generation that came before that pumped the money and the political pressure into the conservation programs that made it all possible. And you really cannot understand where you are today unless you know how we got there. And coming to this center is a good way to start that process. Yeah. And there's a good reason to call it the Hunting Heritage Center. There you go. Yeah. Hey, this is Ron Spomer with my special guest, Tom Gresham, and we really appreciate you folks watching this show. We do recommend this area for a, just a wonderful family vacation and a historical tour. And it'll give you a feel for what it was like in the middle of the 20th century to be one of the premier outdoor writers in America. Hey, this is Ron Spomer. I want to thank you all for watching. Do uh, subscribe to the channel if you'd like. Give us a thumbs up. That always helps. And a special thank you to our patrons. You guys really help keep the lights on and keep us traveling to get these great shows. You know, it's been after COVID. We didn't go very far for a while. It's nice to get out again and see the world and especially this beautiful location here in Lewiston, Idaho. Tom, you got to stop in sometime. We got to have ourselves some more Always adventures. Always a pleasure, my old friend. Yeah. See you next time. Hunt honors and shoot straight.